Hi, and welcome to Dark Window. I'm your host, Jim Mann. Here on this program, I will be talking with many of the leading investigators, researchers, and authors on the topics of UFOs, UAPs, alien abductions, extraterrestrials, and a host of many other fascinating and related topics. So please join me and my guest for the next hour as we reach out. This is Dark Window on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Dark Window. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Jim Mann. And with me here in the studio is a very special person, our guest, Tracy Garbutt Dolan. Tracy is an accomplished remote viewer. She's an abduction uh, encounter researcher, a member of the UFO research community. And Tracy has lectured internationally on her series, The Final Frontier is in Here bringing some of her own personal experiences as a means of opening the discussion on what we as humans are able to do naturally, innately. She is the wife of UFO historian Richard Dolan and directs the Richard Dolan members website and co-hosts the Off the Cuff podcast with Richard and Tracy. Prior to their podcast, Tracy and her husband hosted the YouTube program Intelligent Disclosure which is still, by the way, still available on their channel. Tracy earned her interdisciplinary bachelor's degree in psychology and international studies, uh, magna cum laude, and has been a lifelong, or has had a lifelong interest in anomalous experiences. And Tracy, how are you tonight? And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, you know, just to get, we got to get the ball rolling here. And you are a fascinating person full of all kinds of information and interesting (laughs) topic. Um, Thank you. Let me start off with this question, okay? Yeah. Uh, What has your background journey been outside of the paranormal and the UFO and the metaphysical stuff? So what's been Uh, going on in the background? Thank you for asking that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think like all of us, um, we're all here. We're all listening to this because we have some interesting story back there. But, um, you know, we all have our muggle jobs, you know, our, our, our face that we have to show the world and, uh, and the journey that we had getting there. And I always find it's fascinating hearing everybody's story, you know, just for me, I think I was always a curious little kid. I, um, my mom tells funny stories of, uh, that other adults used to tell her about me when I was in kindergarten, grade one, that I was always super interested in the adults and not interested in the kid in the kids. And it's kind of mm-hmm. true. I, it's so just a little thing about me. I, even when I was a child, I felt like I was way older than everybody. I wasn't, but I just felt that way. And, um, and I just, in a weird way, it was kind of isolating, you know, um, I would play with the kids, but I would, I would always, uh, be way more interested in what the adults were doing. I wanted to explore what they were doing. I had no interest in what the kids were doing, you know, some, but not really, you know? And so I don't know what that was all about. It was just a thing about me. And uh, growing up, I just had this really um, explorative spirit. And I think part of what maybe was the rudder behind that was some of the experiences that I was having, you know, starting when I was six years old. But, um, you know, I, I traveled, I very early, by the time I was 18, I had traveled for a year for the most part on my own backpacking around it kind of a rite of passage in some ways to me, because, you know, like a lot of people, it was filled with wonderful exploration, but also tragedy. You know, I, at the age of 18, I had, uh, uh, during that trip, I had a friend drown in front of me and, um, we tried to rescue him and were, were unsuccessful. 
And, um, you know, we all have these things that kind of shape us. And uh, th this is certainly one of them. There's, a, there's actually some very mystical things to uh, that story. But uh, throughout my life, I've been, I've done all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, I was a snowboard instructor in Whistler, Canada. I was a video game artist for EA Sports. Um, you know, I, I kind of had this thing. I, I felt like in this life, I wanted to try everything, um, everything my heart desired. I, I, so I didn't want to ever stay in something because I felt I had to. I, I always wanted to sample so many different things. And I think I got a lot of criticism from my friends and, and, but that's what I, I had to do. And, and I did. So I actually went back to post-secondary three times. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I, I have a background in, uh, new media and design, like, like graphic design mm -hmm. and, uh, an AS in advertising and marketing. <laughs> and then so I got a BA in, uh, which was my interdisciplinary degree in psychology and international studies, which was really like a lot of it was filled with anth anthropology, world religions, because I didn't want psychology. I didn't just want psychology. I was always fascinated in what made us who we are, you know, but I, I, it, psychology wasn't enough. So I, I went into world religions. I went into the psychology of religion and spirituality. Um, I went into medical anthropology, uh, which was the place where I took a, a deep dive into lucid dreaming via Tibetan dream yoga. And, it's where I really sort of looked at tribes around the world and how they were perceiving medical issues in their, within their tribe, you know? So that, that was really, I needed that because psychology, I knew from my own experiences that it did not cover everything. And for the most part, a lot of psychology is not even going into the transpersonal realm. I mean, it does more now where they're talking about all the things that are beyond the personality, including anything that happens to you, dreams, lucid dreams, abductions, whatever, you know, like it's, there's a, there's a whole gamut of things that happen to people, which I hope we get into out of bodies. And I wanted, I wanted the kind of psychology that I wanted to be having the discussions and exploring anything that was going to deal with and explore our minds and who we are. And um, because I knew from my experiences that myself, science isn't helping me out here. So let right. me explore as what, you know, as much as I can in academia, because I wanted to explore these things in a sort of a in the deepest way that I could, that I thought. And, and of course I got part of my background there and part of my background outside of academia, but that was a long answer to your question, but yeah. it's all a seeker's path. You know, that's basically it's. Well, maybe, you know what, Tracy, maybe you answered my question, but my, I guess, I guess I want to follow through with, uh, what actually got you involved in the paranormal metaphysical mm. UFO end? Yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of strange, high, what we would call high stranges. Yeah. Um, but well, today's, today's paranormal UFO stuff is quite intense. Yeah. Okay, with given, given your background and, and, and that journey that you've taken as a, as a young lady, look at you today. Uh, how did that all get started with what you're doing? You're on my show here. And yeah, so, dark window. I yeah, the, I like the name of that by the way. Yeah. That's, it's very cool. Um well, probably like most people, uh I ended up where I am because of the things that happened to me. So things started I mean things that I consciously know, uh, that I consciously remember. You have feelings about certain things, but I consciously remember some uh an experience when I was 6 years old of these beings that I I thought were in the house and um, I had people's parents come over and check and they weren't there. And, you know, I, I won't go into that whole story, but I basically had a bunch of 
um, paranormally type of things happen throughout my life. But for a long time, I rejected it. Also, like I think a lot of other people too. And I think it's important to talk about, you know, discuss these things. Um, I rejected it and I was afraid of it. And I kept radios and TVs on to, to block it out. Um, I was afraid of being alone. I was afraid of the dark. I mean, really afraid of the dark. And um, because when I was alone, stuff would happen. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I still trip over trying to talk about the actual experiences. So I'll tend to generalize them a little bit more. But I had um, visitation type things that were verifiable in their own way you know i would have beings come and tell me things to tell other people and i would tell them and you know what i mean there would there would be some yeah. weird verification in there um, and you know it just it kept happening and did you um, ever share any of this stuff with any of your friends during your young years never that Never. You kind of kept it to yourself. Yeah, I kept it to myself. It wasn't until I really started. It, it everything came to a head because there was a point in my life where I got sick. Yeah, like a lot of people, uh, something changes in your life and right. things start to happen. I was sick, so I was out of. Uh, I was taking some time off work. And um, when I was home and quiet and, and not keeping my brain busy and not, you know, keeping the radio on and all that stuff, oh, man, things started coming in, you know. And um, I actually went and got, uh, you know, they, you know how every town used to have like free magazines, free little like they were like newspaper material magazines oh, right yeah. and yeah yeah and you and in the back it would have psychics and all this kind of stuff uh -huh. so i i actually avoided anything psychic up until this point and then i went and got one of those magazines and i i found psychic in the back and i called that person and i said hi i don't want a reading i I don't want you to tell me anything i just want to tell you a story and i want you to tell me if i'm okay and I want you to tell me what to do. And this was a turning point for me um, because I explained to her all of these crazy things that were scaring the hell out of me. And she told me, you're okay. It's okay. You're, you're gonna be okay. There's some people in this world that some for some reason they perceive a little bit easier. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna build some framework and you're going to go and you're going to see the teacher. And she asked me where I lived. And she said, there's this wonderful teacher that lives near you. And you're going to go see her and you're going to learn about this. You're going to learn about it and you're going to be okay. But it's time, you know, it's, it's time for you to mm -hmm. learn. And that's, and that's basically what I did. I, I went and talked to this woman and I started taking classes in mediumship and dowsing and you name it, everything. And it, it wasn't so I could go out there and be a medium. It was just so I could manage myself, you know, yeah, and not right. be scared, not be scared. Um, but Tracy, what about brothers and sisters? Uh, did you I all, have, you have, well, that thing, that's a good question. Um, I have a younger sister. She's mm -hmm. a couple years younger and uh, she didn't really, um, she didn't really seem to have anything like this until later. We started talking about this later. Once, once I started uh, um, embracing it for myself and see in a class and seeing what was happening and getting some control, that's when I started mentioning it to a friend or two and mentioned it to my sister eventually. And it turned out that I would have, um, I, I, I often don't like using these old words like visions, but mm -hmm. I would have what I call overlays where, you know, you're, there's solid reality 
and then you will have an overlaid reality where you can still tell the difference completely, but you'll get a, a scene playing out and you'll get information on top. And it turned out that my sister had virtually the same thing, but it came in the form of dreams. So, um, oh, yes. yeah, so it just comes differently for her and it doesn't come as I, it doesn't come as often. Um, but it definitely comes around death for both of us. Oh, um, really? yeah, it, it definitely comes around death and sometimes it comes for other people, but I can't control it. It just, sometimes I, I get, sometimes this happens and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, I, I never know when, but you know, one story I talk about, which I can tell now, or I can tell later is the story of uh, my father, which really kind of solidified for me. Okay. This is my life. And, um, it solidified it for my sister. What was happening with her as well. Um, you know, we, um, we, it, it told us many things. Reality is not what we think it is. Uh, we're so much more than what we think we are. And yeah, lots of people can perceive this. We're not weird. This is, this is normal. So I don't know if you want me to tell the story or you want me to um, hang on no. on that. Um, that's, I mean, if you've got something to say, let's, let's, let's hear your story. I, I think I've heard about the story about your father before, mm -hmm. but, uh, I thought that was a very interesting story. So yeah, go ahead. Feel free. Okay, sure. I, I, I tell it because, um, I think a lot of people probably have stories like this, to be honest. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, one of my main things is I feel like we should be having these discussions more. You know, a lot of people are keeping these secrets and they keep them till the day they die. And, uh, I, I think it's kind of sad when we have this magical, mystical sort of side of all of us that we don't uh, talk about. So, yeah. So the story of my father, my my dad was this uh, larger than life. Uh, he was um, at the time I'm talking about. This is around 2009, and uh, he was about 67. My dad was in perfect health. He was, my dad could never retire. He's doing a million things. He, he was all, you know, like he, he's moving so fast all the time. You can hardly see him. He's, he, he has to stay busy. So even though he retired, he got busier than he'd ever been. He was mm -hmm. helping people with Habitat for Humanity. He was mentoring oh. people. He was, you know, my dad, I don't even really use Facebook. My dad was, had like a thousand friends on Facebook, like way back in the day. And he would go and travel and meet them all from his high school. And I mean, the man was full of vigor. He was skidooing across Canada because it's just something he wanted to do. You know, he's very, very healthy, robust man is my point. Um, there was no slowing down. And uh, so there was no reason to suspect he was not well in any way. And um, I had uh, been lying in bed in the daytime, just, you know, and I wasn't asleep. And I looked to one side, I remember looking at a blank wall to my left, and I had one of these overlays and my father was sitting in the back of my car smiling at me. So it was, a, it was, um, it was an experience. It wasn't uh, like a picture. It was a, like an experience. And it was almost like I smiled back, you know, um, mm -hmm. it was very yeah. real, yeah. but not much else happened. But when it was over, I knew what it meant. I knew, I don't even know how I knew, and this speaks to something we have in us as well, but I knew he was going to die at that moment, um, that he was saying goodbye. It was a very special way of letting me know, because we had a little joke about my car. Um, uh, 
he really? just thought he yeah, yeah i had this really cheap car and i loved it and he just thought it was so funny that i wanted to keep this cheap car but it was perfect for me because i was snowboarding and mountain biking and i didn't want a good car i wanted to you know kind of a yeah. beater car at the time and so it was always this little joke with us and uh, so it was just perfect and um he didn't tell me he was gonna die i knew, you knew he it. was going to die and uh he, he, you know, it wasn't, I, I actually phoned my sister the next day and I said, Hey, have you had any dreams about dad? And she said, yes, she'd had two dreams that he was going to die. And, you know, we thought, Oh my God, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and I thought, well, I'll just call my mom. And so, and I'll pretend that it was just a dream and, and just see. So I phone and I, I was, I would never be so arrogant though to uh say hey mom oh my god i had this you know dream that dad's gonna die i would never say that right, i mean yeah. sometimes these things are right and sometimes they're not that's that's just the reality right so i mm -hmm. phone her up in the morning and i say um you know uh how's dad's health i had i had a little dream you know i was just wondering how his health was and she said oh he just had a full bill of health and uh he just had a he just had a physical he's doing great he's outside right now he's doing this he's doing that and so what do you what do you do with that so my sister and i just decided to do nothing we just have to bury it because it must have just been a false um you know a false right, go yeah. here so so we just buried it and then um it was i don't know a couple months later that I was talking to my dad on the phone or emailing or something. And he just, he just mentioned some little thing in passing, like he had skipped a meal or something. And I just had this feeling, oh my God, I wonder, you know? And so I, I did this meditation. I went deep into the space that I have now cultivated very deeply for myself. I use it for remote viewing and everything. I go there looking for the answer. And the whole thing came up like a tidal wave. And I phoned my sister and said, let's get, we're getting on a plane. Right, she never, she lived nowhere near me. I lived nowhere near my parents. Like we were all very far apart, you know, across Canada. We were in British Columbia, Canada on the far West coast. And our parents were in Ontario, you know, a few provinces over. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 We were nowhere near them. So we we're like, let's get on the plane and get there right now. And uh, we both did. And within a couple of days. And when we got there, my dad was unable to speak. And um, it turned wow. out he got pancreatic cancer and he just went 100 to you know zero really, really, really quickly and um, and and passed. And um, I tell the story because for so many reasons that touch so many people. But one of the things is, okay, I, just to pull this apart a little bit, my dad was alive when this visitation occurred. You know, this we often hear about these from people who've passed. My father was alive. You're talking about when he was in the back seat of your car. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So it's the middle of the day in a real day. And somehow some part of my father who's already seemingly in the future, you know, because it, he was saying goodbye, um, visits me across Canada, let's just say, right, yeah. and um, in the middle of the day and is letting me know that my life is about to be turned upside down. And he wants me to know, I mean, I could just feel all this. He wanted me to know it's going to be okay. You know, that he's, I felt all this within it, it that it was, it was like, dear, it's my time and I'm fine with it. That's that's what it it felt like. Right. Yeah, I would. That's a right? lot to process. To, uh, you know, I. I can understand that's a lot to yeah. process. What do you do with that? Right. You what know? do you Just, do with that? But I will I will tell you that, you know, you know, for sure that there is some other part of us functioning, it would seem. I, I shouldn't well, say for sure. That's the only thing you could come away with. Yeah, right? there's there's I mean, a there's a second part of us functioning independently, intelligently, that is warning us. 
So you and I were having this, uh, talking about this a little bit in a separate discussion where we were talking about out of body experiences, because really we're talking about two parts of us. So there's this other part of us that is intelligent and interacting and, and in this case was warning me and not only that, but through my father's like rapid passing, I felt such incredible closure um, on this because of, of what had happened. It was almost like I had this little tiny vision, but all of this information and all of this emotion and all of this um, additional, there's a, there's a name the Monroe Institute uses called getting a rote. A rote is like mm -hmm. an information ball that's filled, like you might just see a picture of something, but it's filled with all this extra information. And it, it was kind of like that. But it tells us that we're, we are not just these bodies. We're more than our physical bodies, as the Mineral Institute always says. I mean, it's true. We are more. We are so much more. And Well, I, I like mm -hmm. the final frontier is in here. Yes. You know, we always hear space, the final frontier. Yeah. But I think the human consciousness, human awareness, our mind, the final frontier is in here. And you mentioned Monroe Institute. And I want to yeah. move into something here real quick. Sure. What about remote viewing? Tell me about how did you get involved in that? Well, first of all, yeah, the the when I came up with that lecture title, the final frontier is in here. Um, it was after remote viewing, after everything else. And, you know, Richard and I were walking and he said, what is it that you want people to know? What is the thing you most want people to know? And I said, I want them to know that the final frontier isn't out there. It's in here. The final frontier is in I here. I think that's perfect. Yes. It's like the greatest mystery inside our mind. I mean, yes, we can, we can go and explore space, but how much of that are we going to get to actually explore ourselves before we die or even get to know? And then it might even be filtered, you know, we, I don't, I don't know. But once you start digging into all these modalities and you have these experiences for yourself, you see that the key to all of these things is going inside us. And then you look back at what all of, the higher aspects of religions and different philosophies, they're all saying the same thing. They're all pointing an arrow in the same way, saying, know thyself. That's what, perfect. Know thyself. Yes. And, and so I think what it, the reason why I got into remote viewing, uh, well, I kind of bumped, bumped into it, honestly, because I was exploring other things. It's a good way to you put know, it. Yeah, like I was, I was already looking into mediumship, this, that, whatever, you know, I right. had done lots and lots of stuff, but I, I went uh, to the Ramtha school um, and I didn't know that they did remote viewing there. And, um, you know, I know some people don't like that school, whatever, but I'm going to say it doesn't matter what school you go to. It's what what you put into it and what you get out of it and, and what it does to you to help you know yourself. And that school did some amazing things to help me know myself. And um, one of the things was we would do some basic sending and receiving exercises and they wanted to prove to you, well, first of all, they educate you on quantum physics. So you understand oh, okay. the science of, of how these things can happen, like quantum entanglement. And then you try the, uh, it, all these experiments and one of those is sending and receiving like what you would, you would, one person would, uh, be looking at an image and once you entangled either by getting to know someone and talking to them, you, you entangle your energy and then you, you project and you send to them and they try to receive it. And then we did more complicated things. You know, we work our way up the scale and, um, we would do different remote views, future remote views, um, all sorts of different things. Uh, uh, we did blindfolded work there. We did like amazing disciplines. It taught me so much about myself. I'm very grateful for um, the lessons that I learned there. Well, with but, all of um, that, oh, I'm, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just oh, no, I was just going to say, 
that's how, sorry that's how no. i got into no. remote viewing that i bumped into it there and i had to pursue it because it was my fascination with the mind and and my pursuit for myself of needing to know where these minds of ours can go you know if you've had a lifetime and i i know some of your background and you know where you know reality is more than there than it seems Absolutely. well the breadcrumb is there you know and it's i guess it's just whether we take it or not and so it's i kind of felt like i had to explore um remote viewing in the fullest capacity possible to know what my mind was capable of doing so it's always been very personal for me it's never been about i need to remote view the moon i need to remote view this yeah. i needed to know who are we who am i that's perfect and you know i think that the evidence is there it's just that we have to train ourselves to be aware of yeah. what evidence is laid out before us which leads me to another question here as we move on uh, okay since we're on the topic of remote viewing yeah uh, what, what has been some of the most kind of like interesting remote viewings that you've done i mean and and, and let me ask you this what that's an interesting question in itself what's been your most interesting yeah. remote view um and what is, is your approach any different than anybody else's and uh, it, when it comes to mm. remote viewing something i'm not real um informed of but i'm very interested in it yeah so what has been some one of your most interesting remote views um well i often tell uh what we call the the orlando story <laughs> and i i tell it primarily because it it's again showing so many things about us and i feel almost a duty for people to know that this is possible and i always say this but i mean it um i never tell this story to brag i always tell this story so people listening know that it is something that you can do like that we all as humans can do i feel like i need to tell people we can do this um, and that the remote viewing programs have been doing this for a long time. So, so this is why I tell the room, the Orlando story and Richard always encourages that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you know, remote viewing is, is really about your intuition, but there it's a set of instructions on top of it. I steal that. I heard someone else call it that in a very simplistic way. And I love that description. It's, it's really true. Um, it's kind of this intersect in a way of science and psychic. So they were just trying to create protocols uh, to help pull out the psychic in people, right? Right. And yes. uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really what it is. And I mean, it's, you're just, it's a system of asking yourself questions. So they're preset oh, really? questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's really all it is. So a target is hidden from you and you learn the, the questions and how to write it out on the paper. And, uh, you know, just this really good method that served them well, you know, at SRI and, and in the military. And so you just, you just follow this, right? And, and it works for a lot of people. So and, wait, let me let me ask you: mm -hmm. do, When you yeah. remote view, yeah. is it kind of like going into a meditation? Yes. Is it, yes. And you have yeah. a piece of paper that you draw yes. things on, or mm -hmm. yeah. So work? you're you're typically alone at, at your desk, and you just have a piece of paper, and you have a pen or a pencil, and that's it you know uh you could have someone else there there's different ways you can do it but all you need is a piece of paper and a desk you know to write and your mind and so really it's once you learn and you go through all the levels of it um you just have to find your own way of quieting and calming your mind 
to the best of your ability. So yeah, people will meditate. Uh, people will do what they call a cool down, but it's basically, it could be, you're just clearing off your mind. You know, you're really probably dropping into an alpha brainwave, slower state. You know, when we're in beta and we're really, you know, active and alert, you, you, that's not mm -hmm. where you want to be. You want to be just relaxing and breathing. It's meditative and you're just dropping down. So and that, um, that mm -hmm. alpha state is kind of what sort of a what happens to you before you fall asleep. Yes. Yes. So we start, we're awake and aware in beta state. When right. we start to drive or, or relax, we go into alpha and then we have some other stages, brain states below that. As we go into sleep, we go from alpha, uh, down to theta and then to delta is where we're sleeping. Gotcha. So, yeah, I'm just a lot of when people are meditating and, and relaxing, if you if you had them hooked up and you were watching their brain waves, they would be slowing down and you would be going from beta into alpha. That's that's just where it's starting to Is slow that down. The same state that you're in when people are working in the field of hypnosis when they're because I've gone probably, through a few of those sessions. Yeah, you're right. In this relaxed state. You're fully aware. Mm -hmm. but you're like really in this almost a daydream kind of. A yeah. Right. Yeah. Th well, you, you're at, like, absolutely right. Oh, however, with an induction, a hypnotic induction, most likely they're going to take you deeper into slower, gotcha. uh, slower cycles. So they're probably mm -hmm. going to take you into a theta. And I don't know if it was the same for you, Jim, but for me with my hypnosis sessions, they're almost taking you to, um, you know, a mind awake body asleep state, you know, like you, you, you're so tired <laughs> that you yeah. have, I, I at least found for myself, like you have, I had, when they would ask me a question, my ego was so sleepy that it didn't want to fight me. Like it usually would going, Oh no, don't say that. Don't, don't reveal that, you know, like don't, uh, right. the ego gets really sleepy and it's just, it doesn't fight you and you're able to get more truthful information. You know, the critic in us has shut down a little bit. So yeah, the, yeah, yeah, it's that's, similar. That's that ego, that problem is like, this can't really be happening. This is nonsense. Right. So we, away. yeah, exactly. So with remote viewing, um, you know, for me, I had, uh, before the remote viewing, I had become a pretty big meditator and it deepened and deepened over time. And so I don't know if that's why part of it was easy for me because I was already doing that. I loved meditation and I could easily do an hour in the beginning. And I did, you know, uh, after my training, I would do a full hour before I did my targets. Yeah, but you don't need to do that. And you can work up to a you know, a totally different way of, of dealing with it. But, but you're completely right with what you're saying, bringing that into, um, uh, comparing that to hypnosis. Yeah. It's like meditation okay, now. And, and from that. that, Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish your thoughts, I just, please. I was just going to say for, uh, from that state, that more relaxed state, you mm -hmm. are then asking your questions you know, you're, you're probing your mind. It's, it's like your left brain. That's analytical. The interviewer is interviewing the right brain. I love that though. It, it's yes. That I mean, interesting. yeah, it, well, th that's the thing. It is interesting. And where else can you go where you're pushing your mind like this to see what it can do? You know, you, you know what, Tracy, I'm going to get you back on our program again, and we're going to talk strictly about remote viewing. I do want idea. to move on a little bit because there's some other okay. things I, I, I think we need to talk about here. Sure. Now, you have you have mentioned to me in the past about hooded beings and shadow beings and things. And I'm very interested in yep. that because I have a little bit of experience in that. So. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that you had encounters with these hooded beings. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was with a friend and uh, we were at her house. It was not dark. We were not drinking or anything. We were actually watching a documentary 
and uh, both of us staring ahead at the documentary. And this flash happened. And I, this part is always hard to describe, but I feel like I was coming to, but I felt frozen. And I had this, this saying in my head, like that was a projection of the TV, almost like it was fighting me. And I was like, no, that wasn't. And I, and I, I, I had seen this flash of a being, but it was, I always describe it this way, but this is how it was. It was like a slow flash. So my mind registered this whole being and my friend uh, was sitting beside me and I looked over at her and said her name and she was just staring ahead. And, you know, uh, she sort of had the same experience as me. We jumped up and we were saying where where it was standing it was directly between us and the tv it was just a little bit in front of the tv it was super tall it was dark and you know it was this hooded being and um what do you do with that <laughs> what do you do with that so um we did not talk about it for years and it wasn't until i started going to ufo conferences and talking to people and it's funny because they're like did anyone thing happen i'm like no and then boom i had this memory come back of the hooded being i phoned her up and said did this really happen she said yes this really happened and so it wasn't until not that long ago uh talking to yvonne smith she's like you should draw that out and so i did and, and i'm glad i that, did that, yeah, that's that my drawing that yeah yeah that's my drawing and so that's uh, not your typical person with a hoodie sweatshirt <laughs> on that's some other sort of a right and so i have been not obsessed but it's something i do on the side you know i do all the stuff richard and i do our podcasts and different things but but this is i i um I actively seek people who have had hooded being encounters because when you've had something yourself, you want to find other people who've had had these things as well. So you can start to look for patterns and, and why it happened. And so um, I, uh, can I say, I, uh, <laughs> that I uh, ask everybody I know, basically, that right. especially in the field because it's not like i just say to random people have you ever had a hooded being experience because let's be real we hide these things from from the uh, most of the world but you were one of the people that i asked because you had had other things happened in the past happened in the past so that's and very interesting in itself i mean the whole hooded being thing i of course this isn't the first time i've ever heard people mention the whole hooded being right um but that's a paranormal experience. You know, Correct. Jim, I wonder, you know, we always try to categorize and classify right. these things. And sometimes they just, for me, it, it, I guess we could say that I just know for myself and the research I've been doing and the people I've been talking to that I've dividing my research into two areas. One is shadow beings and one which i consider more paranormal but again they're they're kind of arbitrary categories in a way right yeah because we 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 don't know you know but but this hooded being was very physical to me and the robe was very physical to me and so and and the feel of this didn't feel like any other paranormal things that i've had happen it felt more real so so i don't I don't know where to put it, but this thing had a very businessy feel and it didn't scare me either, by the way. So it, I felt there was definitely some cognitive manipulation going on. There's a lot of tales of that in our field. That's for sure. Okay. So I have a series of questions. I wish I had time to ask you, but we're <laughs> running, we're running down on the time here. Um, we hear, that you've been studying abductions these days. In fact, yeah. you went to an archive facility and saw some of the uh, uh, the the letters firsthand. The communion letters. 
Tell right. Me, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, Whitley Strieber and Ann Strieber, right. uh, Whitley wrote, uh, the book communion and, uh, they, after he wrote the book, uh, him and Ann received, you know, tons and tons and tons of handwritten letters from people. Well, a lot of those letters now have gone to, uh, Rice University in Houston. And I was just there with some of my colleagues, uh, Jordan Pease and Lori Wagner and Danny Sheehan. And uh, we were looking at these archives and uh, going through them. And I will just tell you, it was quite an incredible experience reading these letters firsthand. Um, I, it just really affected me. It, it's different these days when we have emails, but reading these, these handwritten letters, pages and pages of people and uh, of people who... Again, this brings me back to uh, what I was saying before, hiding these gigantic secrets in their life about this, these, these things that happen that these that are not explained by science. You know, they're talking mm -hmm. and they're talking about this happened to me. This happened to my daughter. This happened to my grandfather. This and it it made them, you know, go to religion it made them go away from religion it, because nothing in the world is helping them sort this out and whitley the oftentimes they would say this is the first time i've ever told anybody so here you have this isolating thing happening to all these people in the world and this is the whole reason why i talk about these things i still get nervous doing these things but i feel like we need to be talking about this and so those letters um you know, I would, was going through multiple pages and then there's a whole box in front of me. And then just when you get through that, there's another box and another box and another box. There are hundreds of thousands of letters. And um, I am now uh, doing first person abduction research and um, I am absolutely loving it. And it's, I mean, I love it, but it's, it's sad. Some of it is sad especially when people are so isolated and not talking to each other about it. So, um, so much is happening to us that yeah. science does not explain. And this is how I always come back to what my lecture is about. Like the final frontier is in here. And so let's explore what's going on inside our minds and let's, let's explore this phenomenon and let's not be afraid to do that. So that, that's, that's perfect. Um, We've only got a few minutes left, so <laughs> it goes so fast. Here's, here's a question for you: What are you and Richard working on these days? Okay, so yeah, pretty much everything <laughs> we do is either going on the YouTube channel, uh, Intelligent Disclosure, or it's going on our our website, which is called Richard Dolan Members. Uh, Dot com and uh, we've got free stuff there and member stuff but we have a new podcast that two, the two of us are doing together it's audio only which i love and uh oh. we for it, richard and i just talk about whatever we feel like and people will probably be surprised if they hear it that i pull him a little more into the woo than you would expect so i had him talking about tarot one time so <laughs> it's no uh it's kind of a new passion project for both of us. He still does all his same shows, but this is something that we do together where we we bring Richard's world and Tracy's world together. And they're, it's kind of fun. It's We are really enjoying doing it. And uh, so we have our off the cuff. It's a full length podcast that is available to members. It's about an, it can be anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, which is which is this, this is the members version. And then we have uh, clips, we take out short clips, you know, from 10 minutes to a half an hour, and we put those up on YouTube. And that's, that's it right there. Um, so those, those are our clips. And this is kind of one of our, our many projects, but but this is just a new fun thing that we're doing right now. So but a lot of your old stuff is still out there. So people can still mm -hmm. like your, your, your YouTube stuff that you had. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, if, that's still very pertinent and very interesting. Yeah, um, we are you talking about our Richard stuff? Or are you talking about? Well, my anything stuff? the Dolans do is interesting oh. <laughs> in, in my mind. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah we I, we still have our show uh, that we did together archived. It's still there. Uh, Intelligent mm -hmm. disclosure. There's a playlist, and uh, if people are interested and they uh, want to see my lecture. 
um, you know, because maybe you feel alone and you just want to hear someone else talk about their stories or you want to know a little bit more about remote viewing because we couldn't get into it and I didn't I didn't tell my story. I tell it in my lectures and you can go to the Tracy playlist there and you'll you'll be able to get one of the lectures in there. But uh, well, yeah, so that's perfect. That's and, and Tracy, can I have you back on? Yes, you can. I would love to come back, Jim, because uh, <laughs> I kept it kind of serious and and really yeah. I'm I'm not that serious of a person, to be honest. But I'm so fascinated we, with the whole remote viewing thing, which I know that you are very yeah. involved with. Yeah, I'd like to expand on that somewhat. Yeah, it kind of needs its own show, doesn't it? It's hard to mix it, it in with everything yes. else. We could talk. We could talk yeah, an entire oh, yeah. hour just on remote viewing and how popular remote viewing really is and how the government at one time and maybe yeah. still are involved yeah. with remote viewing and the success that they had. Right. They have had. Am yeah. I right? Oh, yes. you are right. Yeah. You are right. we we all funded the the remote yeah. viewing program so, for a long time. So Tracy is great. It's been great having you. We're, we're running up on the end of the, end of the program. <laughs> Uh, is man, that's a quick hour, isn't it? I know that was blink. We're done. <laughs> yeah, we're done. Um, so all I want to say is uh, thank you, Tracy, for joining us here on Dark Window. It's been a fascinating conversation, and we're going to pick up again later. Sounds but to good. All I loved our, being here. Thank yes, you. But to all of our listeners, please join us. Okay, next week uh, when we have another special guest, we will host another special guest. Right now. Um, I can't say as who, but you can bet that it will be as captivating a topic as anything in the world of high strangeness. So thank you, Tracy. So on behalf of my guest, Tracy Dolan, our program manager, working behind the scenes, Patricia Wilkinson, and the team at KGRA Digital Broadcasting, I am your host, Jim Mann, and this is Dark Window, and good night. Good night, everyone.